Somehow I'm not sure about my notes, but I got them on my screen, but it's going to be confusing. But oh well. Um, maybe it's going to be Okay, so Jane Adams. Um, so, uh, how am I going to do this? Mm. <laughs> oh, not ideal, but. Okay, so um, she's one of several people we're going to be reading who wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as a philosopher. Um, she was a reformer, a activist um, in various causes, uh, one of the founders of social work as a profession. Um, and she's probably best known for her role in the Settlement House movement. Right, so the Settlement House movement. Um, basically, the idea was that like um, middle-class uh, people, mostly if not entirely women, would <laughs> would settle in poor urban neighbor neighborhoods. They would have like a house there, um, and they would uh, provide services and also try to like share. Well, I'm practically paraphrasing the Wikipedia article on the settlement house movement, and maybe I should just read it. The main object was the establishment of settlement houses in poor urban areas in which volunteer middle-class settlement workers would live, hoping to share knowledge and culture with and alleviate the poverty of their low-income neighbors. And the most famous settlement house was Paul House in Chicago, which Jane Adams was the co-founder of. Um, and she was also, in her personal life, she was um, in effect, although of course not legally, but she was in effect married to another woman for about 40 years, Mary Rosett Smith. Um, she doesn't say anything about that in this reading, <laughs> but you have to figure it's on her mind somehow. Um, um, so that's all I have to say about her as a person. I started by saying she wouldn't necessarily describe herself um, as a philosopher, but I think it's clear that she has plenty to say about the issues that uh, we're talking about in this course. Um, and um, there's a better way to do this. Maybe if I... So, um, and obviously she's working at some approach to the question, how individuals on the basis of universal principles can come to have a duty to, to a particular cause or something like that. Um, and in some ways, her approach isn't so different from Royce's. 
So, I mean, remember, um, Royce's philosophy of loyalty was actually published after this. Um, they were not really sticking to a chronological order. Um, I think both Royce and Adams had already had their main ideas before this time, right? Like, I don't think either of them was reacting to the other. As I mentioned before, I did, you know, determine that Adams occasionally refers to Royce and certainly had read some Royce. I haven't seen any evidence of Royce, you know, uh, mentioning Adams. Um, um, but yeah, she did. So one of the things she did at Hall House was have reading groups for young people from the neighborhood. And at one point, the, the, they read Royce's Spirit of Modern Philosophy. Um, uh, Royce, however, doesn't seem to have been a major influence on her. On the other hand, she is very closely connected to um, two people we're about to read. So after, so next time is uh, Voltaire Claire. But after that, we're going to be reading uh, Du Bois and Dewey, and those are both people who knew Jane Addams and were um, on had a close relationship with her. Especially uh, Dewey actually named one of his daughters after her, um, and also dedicated one of his books to her. Du Bois uh, would stay at Hall House when he was in Chicago. Um, so um, there's going to be more relationship to talk about in that direction. However, as I was saying, you know, despite the fact that there may not be a serious influence one way or the other, there is a similarity between what she's saying and what Royce is saying, I think. Um, um, that, that is um, the mistake that makes individual freedom and responsibility seem to be inconsistent with any kind of particular loyalty is that we don't realize that, um, at least under some circumstances, individual freedom and responsibility can only be exercised through particular loyalty. Right, so the individual can only act freely by acting on behalf of a supra individual association. So, like when the king demands that William Lenthal respond qua individual, and in that respect, William Lenthal is a subject just like anyone else. When the king says, I'm your king, tell me, is it, you know, are these five members here? Um, and but Lenthal says, I can only respond on behalf of the association whose servant I am in this place. Um, and uh, I think similarly that 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 uh, Adam's dis description of what happens in the Pullman strike, right? So she's talking about. She doesn't mention his name. She's talking about George Pullman. He's the guy who, who like founded that like model town for his workers to live in and whatever. And then they went on strike and so forth. So, um, right. And she says Pullman expects his workers, quay individuals, to repay his kindness to them, quay individuals. And that's why he's outraged if they go on strike against him. After everything I've done for you, how can you, you know, go on strike against me this way? And Adam says, this is on page 158. Um, the men have individually accepted the kindness of the employers as it was individually offered. But quite as the latter urges his inability to increase wages unless he has the cooperation of his competitors, so the men state that they are bound to the trades union struggle for an increase in wages because it can only be undertaken by combinations of labor. Right? So they're saying, like, um, like uh, we can't respond to you as individuals in this situation. Just like Lenthal is saying, I can't respond to you as an individual subject in this situation. Um, and I think 
um, in both cases, the can't is supposed to be pretty strong, right? Like when that is Royce interprets when Lenthal says, I have no eye to see nor tongue to speak in this place, save as parliament commands me or whatever. Royce interprets that as meaning like um, my freedom is, is my individual freedom is like dependent on this, uh, this cause that I'm loyal to. So I can't do things as an individual um, uh, against that. And Adams is saying the same thing about, although she, I, she thinks, and I have to talk about this, she thinks the workers perhaps don't completely understand the situation. I think Royce feels that Lenthal does understand the situation, although that could also be questioned. Right, but but that um, but the, what the workers are trying to say is that you know we've now reached a level of ethics where we understand that the individual can't just um, the individual can't be free except as part of a social group. Um, and that the actions that we need to take freely are actions, therefore, are the actions we can take freely are the actions of that group. So we can't just repay your kindness as individuals. Okay, so I think that's the similarity. I hope I made that out somewhat clearly. Some people are looking skeptical. <laughs> um, but uh, but there are two important differences between Royce and Adams that I want to talk about. And I think they both contribute to making Adams, although, as I'm going to say, there's a there's definitely a conservative side to Adams. I mean, we'll and we'll especially see that in contrast to Declare, who I'm talking about on Thursday. There, but um, but compared to Royce, she's there, she's definitely more radical. And I think, I mean, there's there's two differences between her and Royce that contribute to that. Let me make sure that this is going to show up in the board. Oh, it's out of focus. Oh, no, it's okay. All right. Okay. So um So one is this idea that we're that we're developing from one stage to another, um, and the other is so. And of course, the stage we're developing to is the stage of social ethics, right? We're developing from the stage of individual ethics to the stage of social ethics, um, and that's. That's why the title of her part of the title of her book is Social Ethics, right? But the other part of the title of her book is Democracy. Democracy and Social Ethics. Um, so I mean, uh, um, this is something this this idea of a transition to a higher stage of morality, it's actually kind of surprising given that Royce is somewhat of a Hegelian, but he doesn't really talk about that. About a transition from, you know, I mean, insofar as he thinks our society is developing, he seems to think it's going the wrong way. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, that is, he, I guess by by putting in that thing about estrangement of the spirit from itself, he like could he could gesture towards what Hegel thinks happens next after that, but he doesn't really. Um, so, um, um, whereas Adams definitely like the whole book is is premised on the idea that we're in a transition from one stage to another. He doesn't give any other examples of transitions, right? Like she doesn't say what the previous transitions were. Um, and sometimes it's, it's even, it's hard to see which of the things she's saying are supposed to be specific to this transition 
and which of them are supposed to characterize moral transitions in general, whether she even has other examples in mind. I'm not sure, but she definitely thinks that's what's happening right now. And as for democracy, I mean, it's also kind of weird that Royce doesn't emphasize that. Um, um, I mean, it's true, I don't remember if I got to point this out, that Royce's principle of loyalty to loyalty, like it does at least have the political implication since he won't force you to be loyal, part of his definition of loyalty, right? It has to be freely chosen. So um, it, 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 it loyalty, um, um, you, uh, you, um, you have to give individuals some kind of autonomy, and at least in his weak sense of autonomy, right? But he doesn't really develop that point. And it's kind of, as I was starting to say, it's kind of surprising because you might think like the example of William Lenthal is like, what is he loyal to there? So, uh, you know, you might think he's loyal to the commons, not the house of commons, but the commons, right? Like the people. <laughs> and he's speaking on their behalf, but um, Lenthal doesn't say that. And Royce doesn't portray him that way. Um, I mean, historically speaking, perhaps this is accurate because uh, Lethal became com complicit in the military dictatorship under Cromwell, basically, right? Like maybe he didn't really care about democracy. <laughs> um, but in any case, like you might, you might think that moment, like shows that loyalty to democracy is a special kind of loyalty, but Royce doesn't um, emphasize that at all. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about each one of these things, unless there are questions. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about each one of these things one after the other. So, um, well, kind of segueing from one to the other. So like, um, Adam's version of this kind of moral development theory is different from a typical Hegelian and or Marxist version of the theory. Um, and I think it's different because racist for now. Because according to her, this development is or ought to be cumulative. Um, right, she says this right away on page two. Um, we all know that each generation has its own tests. And then skipping a little bit, the advanced test must indeed include that which has already been attained. But if it includes no more, we shall fail to go forward, thinking complacently that we have arrived when in reality we have not yet started. And that quote definitely makes it clear that she thinks that these transitions have happened over and over. But again, she doesn't, at least in this book, she doesn't describe any of the other ones. <laughs> so I don't know what the previous ones were. Um, but in any case, right, what she's saying there is that like the new um, morality puts us to a new test, but we can't pass the new test unless we also pass the old test. Um, and the part that has already accumulated becomes kind of an unconscious background. Right, so like everyone then takes for granted the old stage, and now like on the basis of that, they're going to struggle over the new stage. Um, this is actually one of the first things she says on page one. Certain forms of personal righteousness have become to a majority of the community almost automatic. 
It is as easy for most of us to keep from stealing our dinners as it is to digest them. Now, I mean, you might wonder if this is really true, <laughs> either then or now. Um, I mean, for one thing, you might think that uh, slavery and the aftermath of slavery were one big exercise in stealing someone else's dinner. <laughs> Or, or I mean, or at least that that was like, uh, um, it's at least that, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so, right, this idea that um, we're in a society that has like solved a certain stage of ethics and we can now take it for granted is questionable. Um, like Adams herself, you might think should know this. Um, as I said, she was, I don't know if she and Du Bois were friends exactly, but they were, they had a work, they had a close working relationship at some point anyway. Um, and she was on the board of the NAACP and she like spoke out against lynching and what, you know, so like, I, I guess it's not that she doesn't know it, but that she's just simplifying here for a certain purpose, I guess. Um, but still, there is there is something kind of worrying about that. Um, but, uh, you know, moreover, and this, you know, uh, uh, so the, that part is definitely a worry. The next thing I was saying is, is just an observation. It could be a worry depending on your, your political point of view, but this definitely has some kind of conservative implications, right? Not conservative in the sense of like, like, um, like voting for Ron DeSantis or something, but like, but conservative in like the, in like the, the strict meaning of the term, right? Like it's, you know, it has, it, the the idea that we already have achieved something and that we need to hold on to that. And I mean, of course, then we also have to go on, right? So it's both conservative and progressive, you might say, right? But it's um, but uh, um, it's not like we'll see declare saying next week, basically, like, um, yeah, we should most of what we have, we should throw out. <laughs> It's not good, right? Here's saying we have something valuable. We should hold on to it and try to go beyond it. It's a more conservative approach. Um, and you know, when she talks about labor activism, which she spends a lot of time talking about. So Royce, I don't think I got a chance to mention this, but Royce, when he talked about trade union movement, mostly said some things about like the unwise. Uh, just labor disturbances or the trade union movement or something like that. So he's not entirely un unsympathetic, but he's pretty much like uh, taking the vo the point of view that things things have gotten out of hand. And, you know, wiser heads need to prevail or something like that. I mean, he doesn't discuss it in detail. But that seems to be his his uh, feeling about it. So Adams is definitely much more sympathetic to the labor movement, but she still says that, you know, the public has a right to demand that labor activists respect, quote, the hardly won standards of public law and order. Um, I mean, she comes back against that and she says, you know, that like, Nevertheless, the, you know, because the public is so focused on that, they may not understand the, what the value of what's going on because they're focused on the fact that the, you know, and like so this 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 strike as she describes and develops apparently, at least according to her, it wasn't Pullman's own workers who were doing this, but the other railway workers started like destroying railroad cars and whatever, right? And um, and she's definitely saying, yeah, the public is right to demand that that not happen. That this be done in a lawful way. I, I'm not sure. 
Like, what if the law says that you're not allowed to strike? <laughs> and it can't be done in a lawful way. I, you know, I'm not sure exactly how she wants to work that out, but she definitely, um, I guess, at least feels that it's a legitimate demand that um, we find a way to do this without uh, upsetting the hardly won games of public law and order. Yeah, I mean, like, remember, like, like public law and order that, like, those were hardly, hardly won games, right? Like, there was the Wild West, <laughs> right? Like, it was not safe. And people, I guess, it's not safe now, right? People are walking around with guns just like them. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, so, like, maybe those hardly won games, we haven't managed to hold on to them. But anyway, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's where she's coming from. The like, I mean, I think you know this point has been made before that people think that that the crime rate in early America must have been really low, but like it's not the case. It was very violent. <laughs> um, so um, you know, she's saying like now that our society has quieted down somewhat from those days, at least in Chicago, if not farther west, you know, we uh, we want to hold on to that. Um, um, but obviously, that you know. Um, that limits the type of progress you can expect to make and the, the rate at which you can expect to make it. And it may make some issues very hard to make progress on because the whole apparatus of law and order is actually like focused on oppressing certain people. <laughs> um, so, um, but in any case, that's, um, um, that's one feature of her theory of moral development. Um, that I wanted to emphasize. There's also something else, which in some ways goes along with that, um, but which I guess is more interesting and complicated. Like, um, that um, the way the transition happens. So you might ask, so, so it happens slowly but surely, as you put it. Right, so it's not like an overnight revolution, and as part of that, some people are farther ahead than others in this transition. Okay, so far so good, but which people are farther ahead? And it turns out that um, it can be confusing when you read it. Sometimes it seems like. Uh, kind of educated, progressive activists such as, her, as herself are the farthest ahead. Um, sometimes it seems like uh, the masses or the poor or the immigrants are farther ahead than they are, and they're catching up. And um, there's maybe to a lesser extent, but there's a similar ambiguity about like the wealthy employers and their workers, like which one is more, has a like more advanced point of view. Sometimes it seems like one and sometimes it seems like the other. So, I mean, I think at least, um, I'm not sure this resolves all these confusions. Like when you read back through and try to keep track of, um, who's supposed to be more advanced or whatever, but but at least part of it, uh, Adams herself is trying to account for, and it's an important part of her theory. So, uh, so the, the first part of it, this is on page 13 at the beginning of chapter two. Our conceptions of morality as all our other ideas pass through a course of, no, that's not what I wanted to read. Where is it? Oh yeah, it is. Pass through a course of development. 
The difficulty comes in adjusting our conduct, which has become hardened into customs and habits to these changing moral conceptions. Right, so there are actually, this development involves two parallel developments. On the one hand, our concepts are developing. And then on the other hand, our conduct is developing. So we're like, um, she says this applies to all our ideas, actually. Um, but it's, I guess she thinks this applies to the development of science too, or something like that. I don't know exactly how that works out. But in particular, we're talking about our ethical concepts. So we get a more like sophisticated understanding of duties and freedom and so forth as time goes on. Um, and at the same time, our conduct is evolving. Like we're, you know, behaving according to a higher level conceptions of duty and freedom or something like that. Um, but so the, the reason for these apparent inconsistencies, or at least one reason for them, according to her, is that these transitions happen um, in first in different groups. So someone, the people who are ahead in this respect may be behind in this respect and vice versa. Right, and she um, says this actually on the previous page, page 12. While the strain and perplexity of the situation is felt most keenly by the educated and self-conscious members of the community. So, that, I mean, this is already ambiguous. Is George Pullman one of the educated and self-conscious members of the community or not? It doesn't seem like we're thinking about him at this point. It, thinks, it seems like we're thinking about Jane Addams and her friends at this point. But... He is educated anyway, I guess. I guess, actually, I don't know anything about how educated George Pullman was. Uh, so anyway, while the strain and perplexity of the situation is felt most keenly by the educated and self-conscious members of the community, the tentative and actual attempts at adjustment are largely coming through those who are simpler and less analytical. Right, so like, Jane Addams and her friends are ahead in the sense that they're self-consciously thinking about social ethics. But they're behind in that um, they don't know, actually know how to live according to social ethics. And the poor people they've settled in the midst of are actually ahead of them. Now, as I said, I'm not sure this resolves all. Sometimes it still seems to switch back and forth somehow, but I, but, um, but I think that's the basic idea behind that apparent inconsistency, like about who's making the transition first. There's, there's really two different transitions that have to be made. And so, you know, the, these groups need each other to make the transition complete. And this, as I said, I was going to segue from one thing into the other. I suppose this is one before you. Oh, okay, hold on a second. Yeah. Is that, is, I think she's similar, like that throw and the make the between like understanding the action. Like you can understand how a good member of society is the between the action actions and further that understanding. And that ideally you mean both. I mean, yeah, that is. I'm trying to think where Emerson and Thoreau make that distinction. Um, but yeah, it is that type of distinction. Okay. Yeah, between. Um, and the, the point being, again, that, um, that, you can have understanding without right action, and you can have right action without understanding. But the tradition won't be complete until you have both. Um, 
So because if we, because you know these people like these people are groping towards the new show, social ethics and they're actually achieving something. And like who exactly these people are, again, it's not so clear. Is the, are these the Italian immigrants in her neighborhood? Are these the striking workers or the striking workers on this side? I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, so, um, but in any case, like these people are groping and to a certain extent successfully after the new socially ethical way of acting. But um, they can't, you know, like if the king comes and says, you know, show me those five members, they don't know what to say. They can't give an account of themselves. They can't give a logos of themselves, as Socrates would say. Where, you know, whereas these people can supply the account, but they don't know how to apply it. When they think they know how to apply it, but she says when they arrive in the settlement house, they suddenly are filled with uh, bewildered because they realize that, that all their fine theories don't apply very well to the situation they're in. Um, so and they have to learn from the people they're with how, how those theories could apply. So, I mean, um, this is what, like, accounts for, leads to, explains, I don't know, the, the key role of democracy here and the meaning of democracy in the title of the book. Um, because, so first of all, for Adams, democracy doesn't mostly mean, um, like it hardly, it all means the system of like choosing your leaders by voting. Um, She's not, so, I mean, Thoreau was actually offended by that somehow. <laughs> like Thoreau thinks there's, at least in some moods, thinks there's something bad about that. She, she, does, she doesn't think that, but she does, I mean, so she discusses, when she discusses political democracy, and, you know, the, the last chapter is all about um politics so she does end up discussing it um and when she discusses it she distinguishes i'll just read this is on page 221 it is most difficult to hold to our political democracy and to make it in any sense a social expression and not a mere governmental contrivance so, right, so the, the distinction is between political democracy. Um, I mean, first of all, you might ask what other kind of democracy is there except political democracy? Isn't there a political system? <laughs> right, like the crossing part here means rule. <laughs> um, if that's one way to translate it. So, uh, but she's distinguishing political democracy and something else we're about to talk about. But within political democracy, she distinguishes between political democracy as a social expression and political democracy as a mere governmental contrivance. And I think the thought is, if I understand correctly, the distinction she's making here, um, um, I think that when political democracy is a social expression, then she's going to say it's a good thing. What does that mean? It means something like political democracy is the way a democratic people would govern us. So if you really have a democratic people, then the, the, an ex, one expression of that will be their political democracy. And in that case, it's a good thing, or at least it's like a symptom of a good thing, some expression of a good thing. But on the other hand, if you don't really have a democratic people, then 
there still may be reason to have political democracy, but now it's just like a contrivance. And I mean, I think, you know, we can understand what it's a contrivance for. It's kind of like a way for individuals to live together without uh, like fighting each other or tyrannizing over each other. Yeah. Um, what exactly does it mean to be a democratic people? Well, I'm about to talk about that, right? So in other, because because that has to do with the fact that there's, that she thinks a more important sense of democracy is not political democracy, right? So the political, but when it's political democracy is good, it expresses the the fundamental democracy. Um, when you know when that fundamental democracy isn't there, well, so I don't think she, I still don't think she thinks it's bad, but she thinks it's um, I mean, it may be a necessary contrivance, uh, but uh, um, but it's just a way for, like, again, for individuals to, like, somehow um, get through the decisions they have to make without killing each other. <laughs> um, so something like that. So I mean, it's um, it's necessary. I guess I would say like it's a it's a useful contrivance given an otherwise bad state of affairs. <laughs> um, so um, um, so you know that's political democracy. So so what does democracy, uh, strictly speaking, mean for her? Um, well, so like. It's a kind of state or practice in life. I think you could say maybe you could say it's a kind of, it's a virtue. Um, and um, and she, you know, when she tries to figure out what democracy fundamentally means, she considers various versions of this. Um, so this is, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, this is all around page six, um, back in chapter one. By the way, I maybe should say something about the history of this book, although I, I don't know a ton about it, but I do know that chapter one was written specifically for this book. The other chapters are mostly like, or perhaps all um, edited versions of talks that she gave at some time before she published the book. So she, I mean, they're not, I think they're not unaltered. They were like edited to, to make one narrative, but they, um, um, but that could be another explanation for why sometimes things in different places don't seem entirely consistent with each other. Um, but in any case, so getting back to this, so um, so this is on page six, she says, we are thus brought to a conception of democracy, not merely as a sentiment which desires the well-being of all men, right? So, so, so right away, we're very far away from voting, <laughs> right? The first alternative we're considering is democracy as a kind of sentiment that desires the well-being of all men, right? Like a, a benevolent feeling. Um, what? Uh, no, I thought. Is it what? What should we say about the fact that that Adams and even Declare, who's far more radical than Adams, keep using this men language constantly? <laughs> Declare even like capitalizes and says, "What we need is men." <laughs> well, but in any case, getting back to Adams, so it's not merely a sentiment which desires the well-being of all men, nor yet as a creed which believes in the essential dig dignity and equality of all men. Right? So that's so the first possibility is this kind of feeling of benevolence. The second possibility is that what democracy really means is a belief in equality and dignity of everyone, all human beings. 
Um, right. So according to either of those, first of all, you can see why you, you can say that's a it's a virtue, it's a virtuous feeling, it's a virtuous belief. Um, and you could see how then you know you could plug that in here and say a truly democratic people. So like on the first alternative, it means uh, people who uh, um, truly feel benevolent towards each other. Um, or in the second alternative, it means a people who, who truly believe in each other's equality and dignity. That like a people would, you know, like that would, it, would govern themselves by democracy, by political democracy. But she doesn't like either of the alternatives. She has, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure also if these alternatives, I, they're obviously supposed to be in some kind of order, but I'm not sure if the ones later in the order kind of include or supersede the ones earlier. Because first we have the sentiment, and then we have a belief, but her, but, but her alternative is not either of those, but it's that which affords a rule of living as well as a test of faith. So to be democratic is not just to have a certain feeling or a certain belief, but it's to have a certain rule of living and test of faith. I didn't talk very much about the rose going on about faith, or at all probably. <laughs> but this perhaps in some ways I think, you know, the time when Thoreau says, people ask me such questions as whether I could live on vegetable food alone. And I, I didn't give the whole quote when I quoted this before. He says, and I am tempted to, to answer, uh, to get right to the root of the matter, for the root is faith. I am tempted to answer that I can live on board nails. And if they cannot understand that, they can't understand much of what I have to say. So, I mean, um, that faith that Thoreau is talking about means maybe um, um, faith that if I'm true to my own nature, I will arrive at the destination that I'm supposed to. Um, um, he also says that the railroad, he has this very complicated relationship with the railroad. He says that the railroad, one of the good things about a railroad is it teaches us faith. <laughs> that it, you know, there's, it's, it's been advertised that these like resistless bolts will be shot from the horizon at a certain time. <laughs> and, uh, um, and uh, and yet the children walk to school along the tracks. So, or he also says it teaches us all to be sons of Tell, right? I mean, like William Tell's son had that apple on his head, and he just like sat there while his father shot it. So, like, um, and he says the moral is keep in your own track. <laughs> so, uh, so that's it's a kind of individualistic faith in the trueness of your own nature. Right? If you stay on your own track, you'll get to where you're supposed to go. It may not look like the place other people want to go, but it's where you're supposed to be. So, um, so, but this faith, the test of faith here is going to be a democratic test. And it's somehow related to democratic rule of life. And what is the rule? So um, what she says in the next paragraph, we are learning that a standard of social ethics, this again is on page six, is not attained by traveling a sequestered byway, but by mixing on the thronged and common road where all must turn out for one another and at least see the size of one another's burdens. 
To follow the path of social morality results perforce in the temper, if not the practice of the democratic spirit, for it implies that diversified human experience and resultant sympathy, which are the foundation and guarantee of democracy. Right, so the rule of living is, um, that you have to live with the whole people. You have to um, not limit your experience. Right, so, she, so in contrast to, to democratic people, she contrasts selfish people and she says, We've all experienced that the, the, the main error of the selfish person is not having a wide enough experience. Um, so the, the rule of living says that, um, and like, I think in this picture, we can see the reason for this rule of living. The rule of living says that you can't just stick within your own group. You have to, um, experience the whole people and learn to sympathize with them. And it's right, it's a test of faith because you have to, you know, believe that you have something to learn from. Um So this is, I mean, it's still, it's not that far from Emerson and Thoreau. I mean, Emerson and Thoreau both emphasize that we need to widen our experience. Um, that moral development requires a newer and broader kind of experience, or as Thoreau sometimes says, experiment, <laughs> right? It requires a new experiment. Um, but now, like, instead of experiencing nature, um, what we need to do is experience our, like, fellow members of our society. Um, and so the, the settlements, right? The, the, you could call you could call Thoreau's house a settlement house. He goes to settle in the woods, that's what he said. <laughs> um the but this settlement um on this line that I feel like is too clever, but I'm going to say it anyway. That like Thoreau goes to settle in the woods, but Jane Adams goes to settle in the hood. <laughs> right. So, right. I mean, uh, meaning, of course, meaning the immigrant neighborhood. Uh, like Black Chicago barely exists at this point, I think. The Great Migration kind of started in 1916. So, uh, I mean, it does exist, and Ida B. Wells is there, and, and Jane Addams knows her, but um, again, she, she seems, I think this is true of Royce and Adams and DeClaire, again, uh, that, um, like, in the wake of the Civil War, um, there seems to be this feeling that, like, okay, we solved that problem. <laughs> um, and even though, again, it's not like, I don't know about Royce, but um, it's not like Adams and DeClaire aren't aware of the things that Du Bois is going to talk about. They know about them, but somehow they managed to write this thing about the progress of our society to a new moral level and whatever without mentioning them, or barely mentioning them. 
Um, right. So anyway, it's not the hood is not the black neighborhood, but it's the Italian neighborhood, basically, and Greek and Polish and Irish. Um, that's where she's gone to settle. Um, so, um, and you know, like, um, presumably that's supposed to be that difference is what kind of experience you need is supposed to re reflect that difference between individual ethics and social ethics. I mean, like what's meant by social ethics, I think based on my very small, like reading about this book, um, that this is kind of a famous issue that it's hard to pin down exactly what social ethics means. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but, you know, um, it means that we have to learn to act in association. We have to learn to, and we have to learn to understand ourselves as acting in association and to act effectively in association. Right? Again, like, in some ways, the people who understand this best are least able to do it, right? So she describes at one point, she, she, she describes a group of like educated self-conscious people on a committee trying to accomplish something. And she says their efforts resemble the efforts of a like baby to do something with this uncoordinated arm. <laughs> um, so uh, like they they know the theory, but they they can't do it. <laughs> um, whereas the poor people in the immigrant neighborhood like understand how to act together. So um, um, there's a kind of ambiguity here that I'm not, or like doubleness that I'm not sure how to put together. It's like related to the thing I was saying about, so what were the other transitions? <laughs> like I, I've just, I've given two explanations, which it seems like one too many. Like one explanation for why we need this kind of experience is that um, uh, different groups are at different stages and we need experience of the other group in order to move ahead. And that seemingly like would apply to any moral transition. But again, without examples, it's hard to say, right? So that seeming would apply to any moral transition. But on the other hand, there's the fact that this transition is a transition to social ethics. So, like, um, for that reason, clearly we need uh, an experience of our society to do this correctly. She describes it as saying that we need to acquire a social motive. Um, So, I mean, when I say those are two explanations, I mean, there are two explanations of why democracy is so important in her thought and in the title of her book, right? One says that democracy um, is always important because um, um, that rule of life that democracy gives is, is universally a good rule of life. And it's universally a good rule of life. So in other words, that rule of life would, would fulfill the function of Royce's loyalty to loyalty or a categorical imperative. That, that rule of life is universally a good rule of life. Um, the rule of life, again, being that you shouldn't limit your experience, but that you should have and not a broad experience of nature or of your own nature or something like that, but a broad experience of your society. That's the rule of life. Um, 
So, right, so, so one explanation would say, and that's always the right rule of life. And another explanation might say, no, that's the right rule of life given that we're making a transition to social health. Um, and like I said, I'm not sure how to resolve that. And it would be easier to resolve if she gave some other examples of moral developments. But she doesn't in this book, at least. I don't know if she might somewhere else, but not that I know of. Um, right, so like this comes, this comes out in her description of a charitable visitor on page 68. So the charitable visitor, I guess this is the ancestor of what we call a social worker, right? The charitable visitor goes to a distressed family and like, uh, the chair, first of all, the charitable visitor is definitely a woman. <laughs> um, the charitable, but an educated middle-class woman. So the charitable visitor goes to a poor family, um, a distressed poor family, um, right? Like there's been a call for a charitable visitor for some reason, and like tries to determine how and whether an organized charity should help them. Um, and this whole chapter two, cha charitable effort, is all about the experience of the charitable visitor. So here on page 68, she says, she is confronted with the task of reducing her scruples to action and of converging many wills so, so as to unite the strength of all of them into one accomplishment, the value of which no one can foresee. I guess maybe I should read a sentence before that too. Her moral concepts constantly tend to float away from her unless they have a basis in the concrete relation of life. So like the charitable visitor is, um, is on this side, but what she's trying to do is, so again, there's two ways to understand this. On the one hand, she's on this side, but her moral concepts tend to float away with, from her if she can't give them a concrete basis. So like if she just stayed back in the charitable organization office or whatever, um, she wouldn't be able to use these moral concepts effectively. And when she first encounters the distressed family, she doesn't know how to use them. She finds herself bewildered. So she needs this experience of the um, of the distressed family to start to understand what these moral concepts, how they can actually be applied. But on the other hand, it's also true that um, the whole purpose of the charitable visit is for her and the family to achieve something together. In fact, that's part of what she needs to learn, right? So she needs to learn that she can't just come in there and prescribe to them. Um, and she learns that because she, she learns that she can't do that because she finds that when she tries to do that, her moral concepts float away from her. Right, so the, the thing that Adams talks about is that the um, charitable visitor says like to the poor family, okay, what you need to do is work. Um, um, you need to work hard and save money and whatever. And, but meanwhile, she's thinking, I don't work hard and save money. <laughs> so, I can't say this, right? And so she had, again, she has so what she has to what she learns she has to accomplish is to somehow find something that she and the distressed family can build together. And what that is, no one can foresee, meaning the charitable visitor coming in doesn't know what that is because 
it has to be partly the, the effect of the will of the distressed man. So, I mean, these things don't contradict each other. It's only my systematizing tendency that's bothered me. <laughs> I mean, they, they all lead to the same conclusion that the charitable visitor has to learn to experience the distressed family and what it's really like to be poor in this neighborhood and so forth. And only then can she start to accomplish her purpose. Um, but there's like two explanations of it. You know, one is that she's farther ahead in concepts, but they're farther ahead in conduct, and she needs what they have to teach her, and vice versa. But the other explanation is that once she learns what they have to teach her, what she'll have learned is that um, she can't, that they can't accomplish something as a bunch of individuals confronting each other. They have to find a way to accomplish something together. Um, and I mean, this really is different from Thoreau, right? Like Thoreau, when Thoreau visits John Field, um, it's true that he doesn't know how to help John Field. Right? So he ends up throwing up his hands and saying the moral education of an Irishman is uh, um, to be a task to be undertaken with a sort of moral bog code. <laughs> like, right, comparing what John Fields does in the field to what he would have to do to, again, John Fields, like the name, it sounds like it must be a pseudonym, but it's not. His name really was John Fields. <laughs> but um, that uh, John Field is the exact kind of field that John Field is working in, namely a bog that has to be turned up with a bog on it. Um, so, I mean, he does experience that frustration, but he doesn't take it as the moral that he has to learn to like converge his will with John Field's so that they can decide together what is best for John Field. Um, uh, on the contrary, the moral is that um, there's nothing he can do for John Field. Right? It's like poor John Field. Um, uh, he and his descendants will never get out of this bog trotting poverty until they get to Laria to the heels, which means until they grow like, you know, like those wings that Mercury has on. Those are Calarian lines. Right. So, like, until, so, I mean, there's, I don't know exactly why he's comparing it to Mercury. Um, but he's, yeah, basically, John Field needs divine help, I guess, beyond my power. So, right. right so, whereas Adam's conclusion on visiting, um, and the Irish were a little bit farther ahead at this point. She says the Irish mostly get the desk jobs and the Italians get like the street sweeping jobs. Um, but, you know, but on, like her um, conclusion on visiting her equivalent to John Field is that um, I can't help John Field unless I'm uh, willing to. Uh, experience John Field and his family to the point where um, we all learn that we have to do something together. I mean, I hope for one thing that helps to explain what this rule of life is. Right? It might seem like not that much. It's just, oh, you have to go out and experience people. But um, but it turns out that like to really experience people means to like um, learn that this individual predicament you thought you were in, like how can I as an individual help them, is really like the whole thing was a mistake. 
once you really experience them, you'll realize that. That's why I said, like, I think that list of the sentiments and the belief and the rule of life, like, I'm not sure, but I feel like maybe the, as you go down the list, the later ones, it's also cumulative, right? Like the later ones on the list include the earlier ones, right? Like if you really have this experience, you won't be able to avoid the belief that they have equal dignity with you and the sentiment of benevolence towards them because, um, you know, you'll learn that uh, your will is only affected if it can converge with their will. Your will is only free if it can converge with their will, I think. So, um, you might think that at this point, although, so we're calling this, we're calling that state democracy. You might think that we're pretty far away from Jefferson at this point. And therefore, pretty far away from um, some kind of issue about Americanness. Um, because after all, isn't this what Jefferson was really interested in? Political democracy. That could definitely be questioned about Jefferson, but um, rather than going that direction, let me say. There is a connecting thread between them, and the connecting thread has to do with what it means to get the consent of the government. So, which one? The consent of the government. Remember, that's the line from the Declaration of Independence. That government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. So uh, Adams quotes, this is at the bottom of page 150. A wise man has said that, quote, the consent of men and your own conscience are two wings given you whereby you may rise to God. Um, and then she continues, it is so easy for the good and powerful to think that they can rise by following the dictates of conscience, by pursuing their own ideals, that they are prone to leave those ideals unconnected with the consent of their fellow men. So consent, so first of all, who is the wise man that she's quoting? I don't know the explanation, by the way, for, I mean, could it really be an extension? Remember I was saying before that in the 19th century, there were conventions about not naming living people. But it seems like if you're quoting someone's book, obviously they published the book with their name on it. They don't mind, you would think. I don't know, but anyway, she, uh, and I think we also saw Royce doing this and definitely see Declare doing it, quoting people without saying what they're quoting. And fortunately, now we have Google, so <laughs> you can figure out what they're quoting. I don't know what you were supposed to do then. Um, you were supposed to have read it, I guess, or it didn't matter who actually wrote it. But what if you want to see the context? I don't know. Anyway, the wise man she's quoting is, um, yeah, Giuseppe Mazzini. This is, I mean, first of all, it's interesting that the wise man she's quoting is Italian. Not Italian American, but Italian Italian, right? Um, she doesn't make anything of that. This is from a book you wrote that in English is called On the Beauties of Man. So, um, Giuseppe Mazzini was, a um, like, uh, Italian, uh, I don't 
know, how do you describe these people? <laughs> the people who like, you know, were tried to unite Italy into a nation and uh, like an Italian patriot, I guess, or something like that. But in particular, he was a Republican. So like he was, Italy eventually ended up having a king who then got assassinated by an anarchist. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, the, uh, Mazzini was was like against that. He was a Republican, um, and uh, and he also wrote this book on the duties of man. And uh, um, Adams, I don't know if Adams knew Italian. I guess she's quoting the translation. I, I certainly don't know Italian, but <laughs> again. Thanks to the like many artificial brain tools that we have, <laughs> even without knowing Italian, I was able to determine what it is that Mazzini actually says in the original. And um, the word he uses, right? So remember, the quote is the consent of men and your own conscience are two wings given you whereby you may rise to God. So the word he uses in Italian is consenso. And this could mean consent, but it can also mean consensus. Not surprisingly, consent and consensus are practically the same word, right? So, but, uh, so consenso can mean either of those, or could be translated as either of those. If you look at the context in Mazzini's book, it really looks like he means this, right? Like what he's saying is that, you know, on the one hand, you have your own conscience, but on the other hand, you have to check it against what everyone else thinks. And those are the two wings by which you may rise to God. Um, so, like, whereas Adams, so first of all, the translation that Adams has, uh, I, again, I don't, I don't think she read the original. I think she's quoting a translation. And I can see why that detail might make a difference. But in any case, so, uh, you know, the, the translation she has has consent. And like, um, at first you might think that this translation has led her astray because as I said, like Mazzini actually seems to be talking about consensus. But the context in which Adams quotes this is when she's talking about like, so for example, um, Pullman deciding, okay, I'm going to set up this model town for my workers. And it's going to be the best place for workers to live. And it never occurs to him that uh, um, he ought to ask the workers what they think is the best place. So he's you know, he's following the dictates of his own conscience. He's doing whatever he thinks is best for them. Um, and, you know, and Adams at least doesn't doubt that he's completely sincere about it, right? He's trying his best to do what's best for his workers. Um, but uh, he, he's, you know, only using that one wing and not using the other wing. <laughs> the other wing would be the consent of the workers, right? So just as the charitable visitor, you know, um, if they looked at their family the way Thoreau looked at John Peel, they would say there's nothing we can do. For them. But instead what they need to say is, Okay, what do you want to do? <laughs> Distressed family. <laughs> and how can we converge our wills until we want, there's one thing that we want. So, right, like, that's what Pullman should have been doing with his work. Uh, 
um, he shouldn't have tried to move forward without their consent. So, like I said, you might so you might think that that's like kind of a translation error, but I think her point is actually, um, and whether she knows this about the original or not, it's yes, maybe I feel like at this point I feel like this is a test of faith. I feel like maybe she does know and she's deliberately doing this. But anyway, whether she knows or not, it, it turns out that what she actually means is both of these, or that they should be the same. It should be the same word, <laughs> right? Like to consent, to get the consent of the workers would mean reaching a consensus with them. And reaching a like a common, oops, I don't have a name here. Reaching a common sense with them, like a common feeling with them. Um, and here's this is something she says on page 230, which I think is not part of the assigned reading, but I'll just read it. There is a common sense in the mass of men which cannot be neglected with impunity, just as sure, just as there is sure to be an eccentricity in the differing and reforming individual, which it is perhaps well to challenge. Right, so now, I mean, this is why I said, like, it's weird now at this point, George Pullman seems to be like that one who did concepts are advanced. Right? Like, but there's other things she says about him don't fit that at all. But, but like, um, um, he's the reforming individual. He comes in with his own eccentric plans. We're going to have this beautiful village. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. Um, this is something that should be challenged. The workers should say, hey, wait, like, can we vote on that? <laughs> We're going to be living there, right? Um, um, so, uh, and that's what she calls a common sense of mankind, right? There's a, there's a sense. There's a sense that's common, and the reforming individual has to um, like get the consent of that sense. <laughs> Can't go beyond it. Um, although, as she also says, and this is on page 158, This is the very bottom of 158. Progress must always come through the individual who varies from the type and has sufficient energy to express this variation. Right? So we need this eccentric reforming individual. The individual varies from the type, but and that's how we're going to get progress. But the progress can only happen if, if, um, if the reforming individual gets the consent of um, the society reaches a consensus with the society, um, like respects the common sense of the society. Um, what this means about, remember I said at the beginning that like Adams doesn't say anything about um, like sexuality here. And when she talks, she does talk, she talks a lot about families and, you know, she always assumes the family of a husband and a wife. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what, like I said, but she must have that in her mind. I mean, and I don't think she's not the, not the type that she's not in the type of circle where she would be like ashamed of um, this or something. She must think that she's an advance, I believe, right? Having this marriage with another woman 
that that she must think that she's in advance and yet um, she also has to realize that she doesn't have a consensus of her society and I'm not sure what she's thinking about that but something she must be thinking something about that um but um but in any case you know I started this because I was trying to say how can we get connect this back to Jefferson well, so like the truth is this view about what it means to get the consent of the governed has political implications in a narrow sense of political. Um, and again, there's somewhat conservative implications. I mean, in some ways they bring her closer to Bentham than to Jefferson. Um, Like, so this certainly rules out invading His Majesty's province of Canada, you know, because we think that the, you know, they they need the free British laws or whatever. Um, but it also, you know, within later American history, it has um, complicated implications. And so on page 152, the man who insists upon, cons or this is 151 actually, bottom of 151. The man who insists upon consent, who moves with the people, is bound to cons consult the feasible right as well as the absolute right. Okay, so right here means not like you know, like equal rights or something. It means what is right. And so that right, the feasible right means the rightest thing that's feasible. <laughs> Whereas the absolute right means what's really right. And she's saying the man who insists upon consent is bound to consult the feasible right as well as the absolute right. He is often obliged to attain only Mr. Lincoln's best possible. And then has the sickening sense of compromise with his best convictions. He has to move along with those whom he leads towards a goal that neither he nor the, they see very clearly till they come to it. Right, again, that's the same thing she said about the charitable of Elizabeth, that the thing that she, together with the distressed family, are going to achieve can't be foreseen in advance. It's going to require convergence of both their wills. And finally, he says, he has to discover what people really want and then, quote, provide the channels in which the growing moral force of their lives shall flow. This is again is a quote, and she doesn't tell you who, who it's a quote from, but it's a quote from this guy, Edward Kerr, the Scottish philosopher who she heard lecture in um, London about Abraham Lincoln. So it's a quote from a lecture that Edward Kerr gave about Abraham Lincoln. And again, what he says is, that uh, that what Lincoln did is provide the channels in which the growing moral force of their lives shall flow, of, that is, of the people's lives. So the you know the point is that, and this is an interesting point of view on Lincoln and what his greatness was or was not. That she's saying um, the reforming individual is going to. Um, not always look like they're working for the absolute good. They're going to look like they're making a compromise with their principles. But that's really what they need to do because um, they need to provide the channel in which in which this consent can develop. Whether Lincoln succeeded in doing that uh, is a good question, but anyway, I'll talk about that. Another time, I guess. See you Thursday.